In this episode, we unpack the secrets of crafting irresistible outdoor learning spaces. Join me as I unveil the keys to designing outdoor spaces that spark curiosity, foster creativity, and make learning an unforgettable adventure. Hello and welcome to Blooming Curious, the podcast that's all about nurturing that natural curiosity in our early years, kids and students. I'm Edwina, your host from the Ed's Lessons blog, a passionate advocate for play and inquiry and on a mission to keep children curious and questioning. The days of talk and chalk are over. We're diving into the world of integrated, inquiry and nature-based learning and exploring the strategies that create lifelong learners. So if you're a classroom or homeschool educator or even a curious parent, then this is the place for you. The outdoor environment has the potential to be an extraordinary learning space, provided it's set up appropriately. The outdoors itself presents us with unique learning possibilities. When you think of all the elements Mother Nature provides us with, there's water, sand, sticks, trees, rocks, pebbles, all sorts of animals, nests and seed pods, leaves, plants, flowers, the list goes on and on. When it comes to providing children with opportunities to play and learn outdoors, I believe we as educators have a real opportunity to provide play and learning experiences for children that they may not be getting in their own homes. We know and hear of so many children who don't have access to a garden or an outdoor space, and many who spend far too many hours sitting down on some kind of electronic device, and we witness the results of that inactivity and sedentary lifestyle on the news and in our classrooms every day. The media is full of reports about childhood obesity, social and emotional problems, and children with poor core strength who struggle with physical games and even holding a pencil securely. So just the same way as you go and you stand in front of your indoor learning space and you work out where you're going to have your different learning zones, so we have to evaluate and plan our outdoor space in the same way as we do our indoor. So what are the considerations? So I'd like to ask you these questions for you to consider as you stand and look at your outdoor setting. Are children going to engage in outdoor play or outdoor learning or both? Are there elements of risk? Does the outdoor learning space provide an opportunity for learning? And what objects or structures are there for children to engage in in some way? Now, where do you start planning an outdoor learning environment? Well, you start with where you are and with what you currently have. As educators, we have very little say in the design and layout of the outdoor area. You arrive and the play equipment is already there. There's a slide, a cubby, monkey bars, a jungle gym, a sand pit, and if you're lucky, there might be a mud kitchen or an area where kids can play with loose parts. So when we're starting out, I encourage just stand there and look at the area critically and ask yourself these questions. Are there any opportunities for fascination in this space? What opportunities are there for authentic play? Are there opportunities for children to move and be physical And are there opportunities for children to be quiet and relax? If you think about it, so many children live in a processed world, right? They're filled with imagery and noise. How many have actually laid under a tree and listened to the wind rustling through the leaves? Or watched the clouds drift across the sky? Or felt the texture of wet sand between their fingers and smelled fragrance of a herb or the grass after rain? I'm not kidding. I have taught children here in Perth, Western Australia, where the beach is just down the road, who have never been to the beach. So these are the kind of considerations we as educators need to have when we are planning our outdoor setting. If you're lucky enough to be homeschooling, on the other hand, especially in a country setting, or you have a forest or a bush or a beach school, Children are gaining rich, authentic learning experiences outside. But what about those of us that are living and teaching children in urban settings? As educators, we know full well that children learn through doing. They build schema by having experiences. Then why is it that so many outdoor spaces in schools are sterile? How can it be enough for us just to have the play equipment or a ball 
or some tricycles? Are we catering for the budding musician or the artist or the writer or the cook or the quiet contemplative child who doesn't want to kick the ball or ride the tricycle? What's that kid going to do? Wander around the space aimlessly, looking for something to engage with until the bell goes and then he or she hasn't even had a meaningful experience? So our job is to create awe and wonder for the children we teach, to find ways to engage them in experiences that connect them to nature, that build schema and that feed their innate curiosity. Dr. Claire Warden talks about learning with nature, not just in nature. That means you need to consider the seasons and how every season brings new opportunities for learning. That's why I like to link my science curriculum to the seasons. So, for example, in your rainy season, you plan activities not just in the rain, but with the rain. So perhaps you'll make a rain gauge out of an empty drink bottle and you'll go outside and you'll observe reflections in puddles or perhaps you see how long it takes for the water in the puddle to vanish and find out why it vanishes. Here in Perth, for example, where everything's just sand, it vanishes pretty quickly. And so there's a whole investigation into the quality of sand and soil and what holds water and what will just let the water run through. And in spring, you plant a garden. And in autumn and summer, you harvest. And so you integrate nature and the natural environment into your learning and your curriculum. And of course, you plan for children's voice and agency. So perhaps you do an investigation into the plants that grow at that particular time of year, or you get them excited and you involve them in, pla- in the planning process. It's also a great opportunity for children to share their learning and make it visible through floor books or a learning wall. And if you're more interested in floor books and learning walls, um, I'll be talking about this in later episodes. So be sure to subscribe now and follow so that you get notified when every episode drops. So you use these opportunities not only for planning and learning, but you also use them for building your community so that you show people how these kids are learning and how they're developing. We as educators need to be alert to the possibilities. We need to be aware and really switched on. Teaching is not a passive job. If you want passive, then I'm afraid teaching is just not for you. So as you stand there contemplating your space, You need to consider your curriculum, the seasons, and what's available for you outdoors. Perhaps you need more authentic equipment, things like real pots and spoons and colanders in your sandpit and mud kitchen. Perhaps you need planter boxes and plants and seeds, or perhaps you need loose parts. As always, educators have one massive constraint, and I know that's exactly what your guys are all going to come back and say to me. I don't have the budget. But I have found over the years that with a little imagination and ingenuity and a generous dollop of determination, you can provide fabulous experiences for children. So many of us spend our own money to provide resources for children. But there's so much we can provide without spending a penny. Objects from nature, for example, on your walks in the bush or your forest or the beach, pick up and collect interesting seed pods and shells and sticks and gum nuts. And then you put those into your loose parts area or into your mud kitchen. Of course, you need to teach and show kids where to put these when they have finished playing. Perhaps the gum nuts all disappear into the sand. Well, how about taking a leaf out of the Japanese school's books and get kids to rake the sand with child-sized rakes and once again unearth the natural elements that disappeared into the sand. What an amazing life lesson. Teaching responsibility and community, not to mention a great physical workout. Another way you can get all these resources without spending a penny is to send out a letter to the class or your community telling them about the experiences you are trying to provide and asking them for donations for kitchen equipment they no longer need. Things like muffin tins and pots and pans and colanders and spoons and sieves and stainless steel teapots, mixing bowls. These are all wonderful to have in the sandpit or mud kitchen and this also makes learning authentic because these are the actual materials kids see and find in their own homes. Or perhaps pieces of fabric or planters and pots for planting into. Or maybe someone's granddad is an avid gardener and he has packets of seeds and garden equipment lying around and he'd like to donate that. I have found that when you go to the community and you ask, they are incredibly generous. But if you don't ask, you don't get. So ask. If you want to create a vegetable garden, 
You need some planters and plants. Why not apply for a school grant? Just a simple Google search for plants and planter grants for schools will yield quite a few options. I know, I've checked. And don't forget to plant some flowers, some wild flowers and herbs. Things like mint, for example. Children can pick these and they can make potions, they can chop them, you can even harvest them and make a salad together. I remember several years ago when I grew sage in a plant in our early childhood space. We explored the softness of the leaves and the smell. And then the children asked me, what do you use it for? So I made pasta and I served it with butter and sage. And I can tell you they polished everything off. Okay, they got lucky because I'm pretty good in the kitchen and I have to be with an Italian husband. My point is, when I see sage, I think sauce for pasta. And it was a great experience for the kids. And you can even take that learning further and you can write and draw the procedure. So once again, you see those teachable moments. They're all around you. You just have to stop, look and listen. Yep, just like before you cross the road. Loose parts are another beautiful and essential resource for any learning space. Once again, go to your community. Ask them. Go to secondhand shops. Businesses and places like Ramida here in Perth, and I'll link um, to that in the, in the show notes. And by the way, next week we'll be having our very first guest on the show. I'm really excited and nervous about that. We'll be talking to our loose parts expert. Um, so make sure to subscribe and follow so you'll get a notification when this episode is published and you won't miss out on that. And here's another little example of how you can incorporate loose parts. A friend of mine who works in a school here in Perth shared this great loose parts idea with me. Shout out to you, Michelle. She worked with a teacher who had these trolleys with loose parts and they would wheel these things out into the playground. I think it was once a week, she said, and just allow the kids to play however they liked without interference of any kind, into their play. The teacher's only job was to make sure the kids were safe. She said it was amazing to see the development of the kids' skills over time. And the first time was a bit chaotic, well, that would be expected, but over time, the play became rich and deep, and the skills, including cooperation, just blossomed. So you see, even if it's just once a week, it's better than nothing. Rich learning and play experiences can be created even when You don't have a playground or even when the outdoor area is barren. Then there are things like logs and log slices, which are great addition to any place place. Not just to bring that wonderful calming element of nature into the space, but great for kids to learn how to walk and balance on, which is great for their core strength. And the slices can become anything from frames for transitional art to plates in the mud kitchen. Their use is only limited to the child's imagination. And again, go to your community. Ask. You might have an arborist in the community. Or check Facebook Marketplace for contacts of your local council. So much is possible if you just ask. You never know what you're going to get. Of course, I so hope that you have trees in your outdoor space. But if you haven't, is there a way you could plant a tree? Could you get the community involved again? Could you have a busy bee and get someone to donate a tree and you could plant it? Ask and you never know what you get. Trees, by the way, are wonderful opportunities for children to experience the changing of the seasons. It's even better when you have several trees. If you're in a very exciting and fortunate position of planning a brand new outdoor area, I learned from Claire Warden, by the way, that you need different types of trees, not just one type. And why? because they all have different characteristics, different leaf shapes, colors, textures. See them as opportunities for learning. Imagine classifying leaves according to their shape, their size, their color, their texture, or making patterns with different leaves. Outdoor math lesson, sorted. With outdoors, like with any space, we always need to consider health and safety. So be mindful that any equipment you bring into the space can't cause harm or injury. And of course, we all need a bit of inspiration. So I recommend you look at Rusty Keeler's website. Rusty is an outdoor learning designer and consultant. He provides all sorts of resources and ideas on his website. So go and take a look at that. I'll place a link in the show notes. And then of course, there's Claire Warden. Look at her website with lots of ideas for children's learning, especially learning with nature. And once again, you'll find a link to her website in the show notes. To conclude, 
Whether you are lucky enough to start planning a brand new outdoor area or you just need a bit of ingenuity with the materials and equipment you bring in, either way, your first and only consideration is this. Does this environment bring awe and wonder to children? Are there opportunities for them to get curious and physical and have you provided for all kinds of learners? I hope this helps you a little as you plan for your learning experiences outdoors and remember, model curiosity and wonder yourself. Ask the kids what they like. Brainstorm together and make it your very first project of the year. And by the way, I have a great lesson plan um, for a picture book called The Curious Garden. You can find it on my website and I will leave a link to that um, in the show notes. It also has links to the Australian curriculum and I've integrated inquiry into the lesson. So have a look at that. I also have another resource for you called Backyard Inquiry, which is great for starting an inquiry into those teachable moments when kids find a bug on the grounds and you want to take that learning further. You'll find both of these links in the show notes. Before I go, I would love to know, as you plan your learning experiences for the term ahead, what is your most challenging experience when it comes to integrating inquiry into your lessons? Click on the link in the show notes and leave me a voice message. Don't forget to follow and subscribe if you found this a useful episode or you like the show. That way you can be notified when the next episode is published. Um, and especially you don't want to miss next week's episode with my very first guest. And I'd like to ask you a big favor, please. The only way that this show and its content can get in front of more educators and homeschool educators just like you is by either placing a review on the show or by following and subscribing. That's how the algorithm works. So if you could do that, that would be awesome. But until next week, remember that curiosity is a superpower. So stay blooming curious.